And it's, it's for uh, awareness, for uh, cancer awareness. I, I have a chronic myeloid leukemia. And uh, the, uh, all the questions asked will give you uh, an idea as to uh, what that's about and uh, how people are coping with that. Also, talk about uh, different aspects of my career. Thank you very much. When did you discover that you had cancer? I was diagnosed in uh, 2008, in December of 2008. And what was your reaction? And what were the doctors uh, telling see. you? Shock, disbelief, uh, fear. It's scary to hear your name associated with a disease that uh, that kills people. So uh, you know, it, it was very, it was a very tough uh, couple of days. I was very fortunate in that uh, my middle son was studying to be a doctor at the time. He was in med school, and I could talk to him about it. And he explained what was going on to me in English, and um, explained to me that uh, until you know exactly what you're up against in terms of the type of leukemia that you have, you don't have to assume that you're going to die. That's a, that's a very important issue because if you fight it, and we have a lot more tools now to, uh, to fight leukemia. Uh, a lot of people are living with it, and it does not affect their lives to a degree that uh, makes their lives uh, uh, a burden. So how, did, how has it changed your uh, health in terms of what you do now as opposed to what you did in the past? I'm able to do just about everything I was doing uh, before I was diagnosed. Uh, the only thing is I have to check with my medical team on a regular basis to get my blood uh, uh, analyzed uh, every, every three months. I have to take my meds every day. Other than that, I'm, I'm living in the same way that I was uh, before I was diagnosed. So I'm, I'm very lucky. What are your thoughts on, on this arena coming to Brooklyn? And what are your thoughts on the building itself? Well, I, it's a beautiful building, and I, I think uh, having a franchise here in, uh, in, in Brooklyn is just a wonderful thing. It reminds me of when I was a kid and, and the Giants and the Dodgers and the Yankees went at it. Uh, Got a rivalry like now, in, like that now in the city. Uh, I think it's going to be great. Uh, now New York has got something to argue about that they can go and see for themselves uh, who stinks and who doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> what are your memories about playing high school ball in the New York area? Uh, geez, high school ball here was uh, a, a great learning experience for me. And I was also able to go see a lot of games at Madison Square Garden when they had the double headers. You know, I, I got to see how the professional game was played, and I learned a lot uh, in, that, in that way. So uh, given the level of competition and uh, just what you could see in terms of learning the uh, sophisticated aspects of the game, uh, New York was a great place for me to, to uh, grow up and, and, and learn these things. Kareem, what would you say is the most important factor going forward just to continue to raise awareness about leukemia, about cancer as a larger issue? I think that uh, the more that we are able to, to reach out to people who have been touched by this and give them an idea of, of exactly what is possible and what isn't possible, I think by uh, just letting people know that there are means and ways to uh, manage your disease and uh, live a very healthy life, live a very complete lifestyle. Uh, this is a, a, a great a great thing. And uh, interestingly enough, the method that they use to uh, figure out how to treat the disease that I have has now been uh, applied to other types of cancer and very often with uh, great success. So a, a whole new door has opened in terms of uh, treatment. Has your disease affected your spiritual spirituality? <clears throat> oh no, my, my, I don't think it's affected my spirituality. You know, I, you know, we don't. Uh, nobody gets to live forever, so something has to take you down. But hopefully, for me, it won't be this type of leukemia. You said the, uh, you also did this at the Lakers, obviously doing your night. How many other NBA teams did you approach about this kind of challenge? Oh, geez, we've approached a number of them. Sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. Uh, but I'll be going to a lot of NBA cities. Uh, whether or not we do it uh, at an NBA game is irrelevant. You know, we just want to get the message across. 
What about future coaching aspirations? Do you still have them? No, no, I, I don't think, uh, you know, at, at this point, uh, I should be actively pursuing a coaching job. I have had the opportunity to work with some young players. Uh, Joachim Noah came to me two summers ago on his own. And I got a chance to work with him, and it really helped him out. Coach <laughs> Thibodeau was very thankful that, uh, you know, that that happened. And uh, gave him an idea of what to do on the offensive, uh, on the offensive end of the court. He's a good defensive player, but his offense needed some work. So I was able to help him with that. Good kid, very humble, realized he needed some stuff to learn, and it, it was really easy work with him. So, you know, when, he, when you have experiences like that, I, you know, I can't complain about not getting a head coaching job. I had some meaningful impact. And the stuff that I know that should be transferred across the generations, hopefully, uh, in that manner, you know, I can still uh, get people to, to figure a few things out. And your work with Dwight Howard, how would you explain that to you? There was no work with Dwight Howard. <laughs> I had one meeting with him, and uh, he seemed like he might want to uh, you know, do some work with me, but it didn't. It never uh, worked out. You know, I don't know what that was all about. I only spoke to him once. I, I, I'm not going to try to put words in his mouth. What can we in the media do to help spread the word about this cancer? I think that uh, just by letting people know that uh, you can have this disease and still live uh, an almost normal lifestyle, I think that's, that's very important. People seem to think that you, you have to go away someplace and try to heal and all this stuff, you don't have to do that. There are certain things you do have to do, but uh, it's not a death sentence. And that, that's, that's really a, a very important message. Your thoughts on the college game and the one and done situation with college players? I think the, the one and done thing is, is a travesty. It really is. You know, it's no good for the college. It's really not good for the NBA. These very talented athletes that come into the NBA and don't understand the game are a waste. So uh, the money that's spent on these guys uh, is, is really going to waste because they don't understand the game. They come into the pro ranks, they have to sit on the bench and, and watch and learn. And they, they have all these incredible skills, but they don't have the uh, foundation of the game that they need to do well. Do you think it would help if college athletes got paid? Uh, it might. I don't know. I, I think maybe if the, uh, if the NBA raised the age to 21 and said, you know, no one can come to the NBA until they are an adult or they have a college degree, I think that would change the whole deal up and uh, you know, make the uh, younger players understand that uh, they have a few things to learn before they can go straight to the NBA. I'd like to uh, give you a, a website. It's called whatsmybestshot.com. And you can go to that website and you can find out my story uh, of how I dealt with my leukemia and uh, the uh, solutions that I found. It's whatsmybestshot.com. Any other questions? How soon do you think uh, it'll be before the Lakers have come back to prominence? I don't know if they'll come back to prominence. <laughs> The way they're bickering out there, you know? It's, uh, it's, it's like, all right, the Lakers had a whole lot of good luck that lasted for decades. So now all the bad luck that they missed out on seems to have dropped on them in this last year and a half. This is life. You've got to learn how to deal with that. So, uh, you know, if they put themselves in a position to, to get lucky again, it can happen again. You know, they, for example, uh, Lakers traded Gail Goodrich to the uh, four on the Jets. Got a first round draft pick. Lo and behold, three years later, that was Magic Johnson. Wow. Uh, now that's luck. But they were in a position to get lucky like that by um, holding uh, first round draft choices. And, uh, you know, that, that's the only way you can do that. So, you know, being smart, you know, in your business model and being lucky, uh, you've got to have both of them happen. And that's, that's the only way you get back to the top. But uh, like they, they have some money, they have some cap space uh, to get some uh, draft picks. Uh, hopefully they don't uh, get it back together. But everybody in L.A. is dying. Okay? They're like, oh, man. Clippers, they have a good team, but the, their luck uh, seems to stay bad. What, what can you do about that? Did you read the new book on Showtime? No. Uh, I'm not going to.
your thoughts on Phil Jackson and taking over for the Knicks, and is it important for that franchise to be successful for the overall NBA? Well, I, I'm sure that uh, the Knicks having a, a, a very good team helps the NBA. New York is the media capital of the country, uh, but the Knicks do well. Uh, that province, it, it shines all over the place. Uh, Phil has a tough job, and it's not my coach. So I, I don't know how well he, or bad he's going to do. I'm not going to predict it. Um, you know, I, I wish him luck. Well.